Today I'd like to share with you how I have grown this wonderful Napa cabbage in my gardens over the past four years. I just want to show you some tips and tricks so that you can grow this too. Um, you may have to adapt some of these to your climate because my climate is 6B and we have a pretty long extended cool season. So we're going to take a closer look at how to plant it and when and how to water and feed it. Also, some of the pests and diseases you may experience, how to harvest it, and different ways that you can use it in your kitchen. So in a recent report, it came in second as far as nutrient density, and this is measured calorie per calorie against about 47 other fruits and vegetables. I already showed you how to grow watercress, which came in number one, and so here are just some of the vitamins and minerals and other nutritional information you might want to know about this wonderful cabbage. Feel free to pause the screen if you like. I'll try to leave a link below the video for you as well. So Chinese cabbage comes in two different forms. Some of it is leaf cabbage, which I also grow, and then the heading cabbage. For this video, I'm going to concentrate on heading cabbages. And you can always refer to your square foot gardening book. It will explain how to grow just about any vegetable that you want to in a very easy way. Okay, it's very easy to understand. Don't overlook the charts in the back. They are very valuable for the beginning gardener to help teach you how to get your plants out in your garden. Also, your extension office may have a chart to tell you for your area when you need to start your plants indoors and when you may need to move them out. So much of this information can also be applied to just growing regular green heading cabbage. If you're unsure about your pH, you can check it. It should be between about 6.0 and 6.5, and you will need to have a sunny location. I like to start my cabbage indoors because I really need to harvest that head of Napa cabbage before my temperatures creep up into uh, above 75 degrees Fahrenheit. You want to harvest it before your summer heat starts in or it will bolt. Also, if you're planting it for the fall, try to plant it before your uh, daytime temperatures drop to below 45 degrees Fahrenheit so it will head up okay so I'm going to go over how we're going to start our seeds um, this year I changed my seed starting mix to cocoa coir and it is working beautifully I'll leave a link to my video on how I've used it in case you missed that video your cabbage seeds should last about five to six years and the date will usually be on your seed package. There's also information on there to help you grow. I cannot sow my seeds directly outside because I don't have enough time for it to head up. However, with the leaf varieties, you should be able to do that. Now, I like to use a little window sill box, and this just keeps it nice and neat in my home. And I have 36 cells here. I usually start about six at the end of February, along with some other cool season vegetables that I like to grow. I'll leave a link for this little box below the video as well. And so I'll just put about two or three per cell and mist the top of them. You want to keep them misted until they germinate. And so I like to put them on my windowsill by my sink and put this little chart. That's how I keep up with what I planted in each cell. I like to put that right there on my refrigerator. So when I have them in front of my sink on the windowsill, it just makes it easier for me to check on them and to keep them misted. They should germinate fine if your home temperatures are between about 50 degrees Fahrenheit and 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So I will begin to water them from the bottom. That's why I like these little trays like this. And then after they have their third leaf, you can go ahead and start to feed them with a diluted um, water soluble fertilizer from the bottom. So I'll just move these outside in the natural sunlight. I don't use grow lights. Usually in late February or early March, my temperatures are very cool. So I can just leave those out there unless it really gets cold, like in the 20, to, you know, 20 degrees Fahrenheit, I will bring them inside. Otherwise, these cool season crops suggest very nicely to just being outside at this time of the year. So I just keep my eye on the weather forecast. If it looks like there's going to be a lot of rain, I'll remove them from the watering tray so that they do not drown. And then I'll just put them back after the threat of rain is gone. So I just kind of let the weather forecast tell me what to do with my baby seedlings. Now I also like to succession plant this crop. So your book will show you um, that you can plant these about two weeks apart. So I do this two times 
uh, about two weeks apart in the very early spring. Here's an example. These two trays I planted two weeks apart. So about six weeks later, this is how they'll look. And that's when I'll begin to move them into the garden. I want to plant them apart so that I can go out to my garden and pick maybe two heads a week for about four weeks. Okay. Now I'll leave some in my cell trays instead of moving them out. This does stunt the growth a little bit. I don't like to do that. Your, your plants really benefit from being moved out into the garden as soon as you can get them out there, especially these cool season vegetables. They'll start to take off a lot faster if you can just get them out there. Make sure your soil is well draining. I always try to plant about 25% more than I intend to harvest in case of pests or diseases. Or maybe one of the places where I planted in my garden didn't have a really good soil pH for cabbage to grow and it didn't take off like my other one. So I always kind of scatter these throughout the garden in different spots. I also like to put a little bit of slug bait around my baby seedlings early in the spring because slugs also love those cool temperatures and the moist conditions that spring usually provides. Usually when I plant my cabbages, I always throw a little bit of compost into the uh, planting area first, but this example here, it was early in the spring and I had already amended my bed with compost, so I didn't need to do that, but always give it a little compost if you're planting it somewhere um, that you have not already amended the soil. And I do all this again in the middle of the summer, about July, for my fall planting. And so cabbage loves water. I like to keep um, a water can in my garden because I don't have an irrigation system and that way I can just water at the base of the plant. Now when it starts to form a head, and this is especially true for the more compact heading cabbages, not so much for the Napa, if you overwater it, once it's formed a head, it will split and that can damage your crop. Water it about two inches a week between whatever you're hand watering or what you see in the rain forecast. And you, I like to just side dress my plants with a blended complex compost, but you can always, of course, just use a well-balanced water-soluble fertilizer. Now this is where most of your problems are going to come in. This is the uh, pest portion of the video. Cabbage is a magnet for everything. Everything wants to eat cabbage before you get a chance to. So if you notice some insects like aphids or ants around your plants, then I will leave a link below the video for some ways that you can control your insects. This is a great way that's a less toxic to the environment of ways you can just spot treat your plants. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of these insects so you can um, probably identify them. Now here's an example where I have a very bad slug problem in one of my beds, and this is why I said I plant things around a lot of different areas. Um, so if you see damage like this, this is obviously from slugs, and I needed to treat again, even though I put some out when I first planted it. I guess it just got away from me. So uh, you'll just take a little bit, about a teaspoon. I probably put a little more than you should. This is called, uh, this brand here is called Sluggo, but most of all of your slug baits are approved for organic gardening, and um, they're very easy to use. So if you notice some damage like this, it might not be too far gone. You can go ahead and still treat around your plant. And on closer investigation, if you were to look down into the cabbage plant, you most likely find some small slugs. And that's the problem here. Um, some of these bigger hauls that I've seen before, I think these are caused by what's called a cabbage looper. A lot of times the loopers are like um, little inchworms. So whenever you see droppings like this, here's an example where I had a looper on a mint plant that I was growing in a little smart pot. I always, if you see droppings, look above, you may find a camouflaged worm. Mm -hmm. And this is a cabbage looper here. The other one was a different kind of looper, but they basically um, just have the front legs and the back legs, and they look kind of like a, what you call a little inchworm. Now, there are other things that you can treat for if you notice uh, problems on your 
cabbage or any of your brassica plants and that is to treat with a product called bt which is also approved for organic gardening and this simply destroys the digestive tract of worms when they consume the leaf now if it rains it's going to wash this off so make sure that you are spraying underneath your leaves the little cabbage butterfly you see flying around here that little butterfly is laying eggs and those are where your little worms come from they're usually underneath your leaves I found them on the top of my leaves when it's not real sunny. There'll also be other eggs around. So these are just some examples of ones that I found in my garden because I don't spray anything in my garden to kill all insects. I'd like to try to attract beneficial insects to my garden. So now here is a row cover. This is one way you could protect your plants from um, the butterfly or many of the other insects. I find that this is a little bit harder to work with. Um, because you have to lift it up to tend to your plants and then cover it back down and make sure whenever you use some kind of cover that it is sealed tight around the bottom because those butterflies have nothing else to do but to get in there and reproduce okay they're going to try to get to your cabbage or your broccoli or whatever it is so I've started to use this little cover it's like a bed canopy a mosquito net that worked real well and so this could give you an example of some of the growth that I had last year when I used my netting. Um, make sure, like I said, make sure it's secure because one time I did look down at my garden and there was a butterfly and they're flying around and it went up underneath a crack and got in there. <laughs> so they will do whatever they can to get to your plants. And so this is basically some of the growth I had last year and I didn't have to spray it or anything like that, which was really nice. And so here is an example of the BT that I was just talking about. You'll just mix it uh, for your, just mix it according to your package instructions. Over the past year, I have changed one of my gardening practices, and now I grow kale, but I no longer grow it to, for consumption. I grow spinach for our leafy green for the family. I grow kale to a, attract that cabbage butterfly so it will stay off of my ca the cabbage that I want to eat. It prefers the kale much better than the cabbage. So that's what I do, especially at the river. Um, both of the river gardens, I'll plant kale, but I don't really plant them for eating. That's one easy way to control the worm uh, and keep it off your cabbage. Just plant something else that it will prefer to eat other than what you want to eat. <laughs> Another insect that loves to get on your kale and broccoli and your cabbage is the harlequin bug. I haven't had a real bad infestation with these except one time about five years ago. Um, but this is what it looks like and this is what their eggs look like. So again, refer to that sheet where you can try some of those less toxic insecticides and I would just spot treat these plants where you notice there's an infestation. And for worms, believe it or not, I try to attract birds to my garden because they for some reason know where those worms are and they will jump down and eat them. I saw one jump down on a big tomato plant I had on my, in my container garden and there was a hornworm on there and it just went down, ate it and took off. So that's instant insect control. Of course there's always animals. Animals especially uh, like um, rabbits love cabbage. So if you notice paw prints in any of your raised beds uh, you probably have a problem. Sometimes I'll just put a little trap out. I get this at Harbor Freight and we can trap animals that have been visiting the garden and then just relocate them. Uh, you will notice the outside leaves, uh, they will look like they've been chewed on. So that's either footprints or um, chewed leaves will give you an idea that an animal has been feasting in your garden. So for animal control, you can just trap them or something else that I have seen is a deer repellent or animal repellent. A lot of those I do not work. I have tried them. However, there was there is one that I have seen that's highly recommended and it really works. And I'll leave a link to it below the video if you want to give it a try. So another thing that will happen with your cabbage, if it gets hot, it will bolt to seed. Of course, you can let it bolt and then just save the seed. But if it's a hybrid, you can't do that because it may not grow true to the parent. Uh, but if it's an heirloom cabbage that you've been growing, you can save that seed and then grow it the next year. As a matter of fact, I might give some of those varieties a try. The one reason I grow hybrids over heirlooms 
for some vegetables is because they are bred for disease resistance and better production a lot of times. So that's why I like to grow hybrids. But I'll, most of my seeds are heirloom. So if you want it to go to seed, you'll notice that it'll grow up through the center and it'll start to produce little flowers. And then out from there will pop little pods. And these will plump up and turn into big pods which have your seeds in it and you can basically just let that um, stay in your garden and then I will oftentimes just pull them out and dry them that way. So once they're nice and plump you can uh, dry them and you'll have free seed. Um, one thing that likes to eat your uh, pods is the cabbage pod weevil. So look out for that insect. So now this is just how I harvest my cabbage. I like to pull the whole head of cabbage, though most instructions for harvesting cabbage will tell you to cut it down at the base. Um, I did also read on the Farmer's Almanac website that you can just cut out the cabbage and leave the leaves and it may grow some more. I don't know if that's true for Napa cabbage or not, but I thought that was interesting so I wanted to make sure to include it in this video. I may actually try it this year and I'll leave information below the video um, when, at the end of this year so that you can see. I no longer harvest my cabbages all at once. That was from about four years ago because now I like to succession plant. I've learned how to succession plant where I can just go out, pull ahead of cabbage, take it inside and eat it and you get a lot more more of the nutrition from your vegetables when you can consume them within um, minutes or hours of having harvested them okay now if you notice there's a lot of damage on the outside of your cabbage a lot of times I have slug damage from early in the season but I'll just pull those off and you'll be surprised you'll have a perfect beautiful head of cabbage in there and you can compost your leaves so there's no waste there okay so I just like to cut off the root there and like I said, you may want to just cut it off at the root in your garden, but I need that space to plant behind it. I like to come back behind it with green beans or carrots or spinach or something like that. So I pull out my whole head of cabbage. And once you've harvested it, you'll want to give it a good wash in some cold water, along with maybe a little splash of vinegar just to kind of kill any bacteria in there. And I like to remove the green tender part for my salads. I love to eat this raw. You can cut up the stem and use that in stir fries or in soups, but you'll want to cook that a little bit longer than your um, nice green tender leaves. One of my favorite things to make, and this is why I love to grow this cabbage, is just a Chinese cabbage. It's made with a very simple dressing. And I have this on my channel if you'd like to check it out. Of course, it's always good in things like coconut milk soup. I try to use um, a different kind of vegetables from my garden and make a really nice coconut milk soup. You can pickle it in a little bit of vinegar and sugar and then just use that on tacos like a fish taco. Um, I also have a video on my channel for this beef with bok choy. So this was the leaf cabbage I used but of course you can use the heading Napa cabbage. And always your nice spring vegetables are wonderful and a good stir fry. So for a stir fry, I would put the white stem in there first to get it tender and then I would add my leaves. So for recipes, you can head over to my channel and click on the playlist section and over there, there will be some recipes where you can give them a try. Also, there's one over there for kimchi, which is the most popular way that this cabbage is used. So there you go. So hopefully you enjoyed the video. If you did, please let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and feel free to share this on your favorite social media platform. I sure would appreciate it. Thanks so much for watching and y'all have a beautiful day.